everyone here. Is there anyone here who knows Russian? Well, I do. <laughs> um, I will. I will keep the Russian part of it minimal. Um, so, from loving pets, mostly we're going to be talking about suicide. Um, when I, I, I was interviewed for this book, and somebody said to me, "This book is so playful." People who say that about Russian literature, like are way too deep into Russian literature if they consider this book playful. And she and it talked about likability and you know, what do you, you know? And I said, I translate Russian literature. Likability isn't really a category. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I'm very happy about this, uh, about the whole event of Women in Translation Month. Um, I really, when I started out, I think almost everything I translated was by women. And actually, it was sort of a ploy because there are so many great neglected women writers that it's opportunity for for, the, for translators, especially things that are in the public domain. So um, that was really kind of where I began. It was a long time before I actually translated men in any significant way. I have since translated both. Um, and the reader, or the author I'm going to be reading from now is is um, Olga Slavnikova. She's a contemporary writer. Um, I've translated quite a bit of her of her um, of things she's done. I did um, a novel called 2017, which sometimes is up for sale here, uh, which won the Russian Booker Prize. And I've done quite a few stories. She I'll just tell one other funny story about her. She she did a she got asked by Russian Railways, so like the, for their in train magazine, to do a series of 12 stories about trains, you know, like you have an in-flight magazine and they'll maybe run a story or something. So she was supposed to do them about trains. And so she did them and she sent them to me and I read them and I said, Olga, these are great, but in four of them, there are train wrecks. <laughs> <laughs> so can you imagine, in, you know, America, Sky, whatever they do, having a thing with a plane crash in it? <laughs> uh, she said, well, yeah. <laughs> that was pretty normal for her. Um, anyway, many stories about Olga. Um, so I've read, so the, this this book is one of um, the very few in my long years of translating. It was actually my idea. It's one of my very favorite things that she ever wrote, and I had the opportunity to pitch something that was my idea, not just get asked by a publisher. And so I. So they did it. They did the book. The book in Russian is called Bismertne, which means the immortal one. In French, it's uh, l'immortel. Um, and that doesn't leave a lot of good options in English. The immortal, the immortal one. That's one of the worst titles that I've come across, um, unless you're writing science fiction. Yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> so I called it uh, The Man Who Couldn't Die, because it has a double meaning. It means he couldn't die because his family didn't want him to die. Oh, Papa, you can't die. And he also couldn't die because he was trying to kill himself. But he was half paralyzed and couldn't. <laughs> so, only in Russia, right? Um, <laughs> the, the book is set in post-Soviet uh, post-Soviet Russia, and it's got several threads of plot lines, which I'll, I won't go into here, except in so far as you need to. It centers around a small family. Uh, this veteran, uh, Alexei Afanasyevich, who was a war hero, had a stroke later on, became half paralyzed, is in bed. Um, and nobody knows what he's thinking. Um, his wife, Nina Alexandrovna, who um, you'll find out more about her when, in the reading, and then their daughter, Marina, who is trying to make it in the new Russia. So she's gotten involved in a political campaign. She's trying to be in TV news. Um, she's, she's making the effort. She's young enough that she thinks she can make the transition. So uh, the, the first pass, I'm going to read two short, well, one longer and one um, <coughs> shorter and one longer passage. Um, it's, it's about Marina. It's about her husband who she's just split up with. And it's, 
I, re I read it at other readings, mostly because I think it's really beautiful. Uh, Slavikov is a, very, is a very complex writer. She uses a lot of abstract philosophical concepts just in the narration. It's very heavy on metaphor and images and long sentences. So, um, you know, just let it wash over you. I'm not sure that, um, you know, there were many things you don't understand. Um, in this in this first passage, um, it's about her husband leaving, but it's also about her, uh, it, it references people in the, a political campaign. So the campaign manager and the, can and the candidate, it's not that important for this passage, um, but I think it's kind of a brilliant passage. I'll read a little bit in Russian. После ухода Кримова все оказалось в точности таким, как предвидела заранее, и в то же время каким-то ненастоящим, словно Марина обживала придуманную среду, кем-то когда-то описанную в словах. Если она куда-то шла, то у нее создавалось впечатление, будет она идет рассказанным маршрутом, опознает рассказанные знания и переулки довольно зыбко отвечающие со сообщенным приметом. И порою со несовпадением множились так, что Марина теряла направление и могла бы заблудиться, если бы не странная немногочисленность вещей. Мир вокруг нее оказалось удивительно пуст. Это соответствовало разорению поздней осени, когда на голых улицах кажется, как будто что-то убрано и снесено. А что? Непонятно. И сердце ищет несуществующее. И те деревья, на которых не осталось уже ни одного листа, на глазах заполняются веществом пустоты. В их подчерневших ветвях не остается ни одной ячейки, ни налитой до отказа пустым бесцветным пространством. After Klimov's departure, everything seemed both exactly the way it had before, and at the same time, slightly unreal, as if Marina had rendered habitable an invented environment that someone had once described in words. If she was going somewhere, she felt as though she were taking a narrated route, and she would recognize narrated buildings and lanes that corresponded rather loosely to their communicated features. And sometimes the discrepancies multiplied so quickly that Marina's sense of direction evaporated, and she could have gotten lost if it weren't for the strange paucity of things. The world around her was surprisingly empty. This corresponded to the devastation of late autumn, when something on the naked street seems to get cleared away or borne off, but you can't figure out what, and the heart searches for what doesn't exist and you see trees on which not a single leaf remains filled with a substance of emptiness, and their blackened branches don't have a single cell left not filled to bursting with empty, colorless space. All this time, Marina couldn't shake the physical sensation that nothing was worth anything now. Randomly wandering into high-end clothing stores, she could barely keep from laughing when she discovered tags on soft slippers with seven-figure prices that meant exactly nothing. Now Marina imagined the same kind of label on the back of each person's neck. When she watched press professor Shishko scribbling and speckling the campaign's newspaper galleys with insertions, as if deriving the square root from each statement and turning the article into a system of mathematical calculations, the professor seemed to be distracted by his irritatingly stiff, neck-scraping label. When candidate Krugal, having first looked around to make sure there were no reporters, started luxuriously scratching his back against the door jamb as if dancing the lombada, not sparing his cashmere Hugo Boss jacket one bit, Marina had no doubt that the artist had a whole sheaf of that lacquered stuff dangling from his collar. No, Marina didn't really feel bad. She could smile and joke as if nothing were the matter, although her voice gave her away more than her usual even serenity, her even voice, and her half-masked eyes. and taking care of her husband, happens to walk in on him, not on schedule, down to his room, and finds that he has been trying with his one good arm to fashion a noose that he can, that he can hang himself off the bed. 
uh, this is in the context of uh, him having garroted, gone, been a reconnaissance scout in World War II and garroted many people. So he had this history of using string to uh, strangle people. Um, it's a little bit fantastic where the string comes from. Not quite sure that, you know, that's a little bit in the realm of fantastic, but so is the whole thing. And there's a moment of recognition when she catches him doing this, when he, when it's like, oh, this is real now. Like their whole game of how she was taking care of him and how he was pretending to be what he was, all of a sudden they cut through that. And although there was no spoken acknowledgement, it was sort of, she knew, she knew. So this is after she has witnessed him trying to uh, hang himself. Upset, but trying her utmost not to give herself away, Nina Alexandrovna observes his desperate struggle. The paralyzed man's material world, which had been stripped of any detail and reduced to large schematic, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot one thing. He's, he's, um, he has these little toys that he plays, stuffed animals that he has in bed with him, including a, a rubber spider that, you know, the kind you can squeeze and it'll jump. So that, that turns out in here. So that's part of his life with those objects. I'm sorry. Um, the paralyzed man's material world, which had been stripped of any detail and reduced to large schematic objects, the only ones accessible to his manipulation, reminded her of the letters on a child's building block or the top line on the eye chart. And the large font in which this destiny was written evoked her respect and a superstitious fear. Nina Alexandrovna sometimes thought of her Alexei Afanasyevich as an overly ambitious pretender to the throne, a shadow general secretary of the Communist Party. The veteran's struggle with matter, which previously had been limited to the toy stuffed animals he conquered, had taken on an altogether new quality. Nina Alexandrovna couldn't imagine how the paralyzed man, who couldn't bring a spoonful of kasha to his open mouth, might wrench his own death from the world around him. There are many things even a healthy man has trouble doing for himself, a haircut say, or a foot massage, let alone commit suicide. Nina Alexandrovna knew from her own experience that this type of self-servicing requires agility, strength, and the skill of a hunter chasing a wild beast. What was she saying? It took more, much more, to be both hunter and hunted in your one and only body, to battle yourself with a kitchen knife, this Nina Alexandrovna remembered well. <laughs> she remembered the new knife, sharpened spotlessly clean until the wet stone slick was black, sticking into her ribs dully like a finger. And even when she stripped to her bra, thinking her slippery brass blouse was the problem, it was still no use. You had to make some special movement, a little like the twist she knew how to make squeezing into an overcrowded bus and opening a jar simultaneously. It was too hard, though. Maybe it was something you had to learn to do. But how? Nina Alexandrovna knew better than anyone, maybe even better than her heroic husband, that it's easier to kill someone else than yourself. Suicide is a job for the left hand, and if you're not born a lefty, then you do it the wrong way around. True, it was Alexei Afanasyevich's left hand that could move, but what use was that? After all, he was spread eagle on the ground. Yes on the ground, even though there were five stories and a cellar between the veteran and the earth. Since the dimensions of his flabby body had lost all physical meaning, you could think of him as Gulliver in the land of the Lilliputians, tied down by hundreds of thin strings over which his fat rubber spider scurried, testing the rigging. Now watching Alexei Afanasyevich through the keen diopters of her dozing trance, Nina Alexandrovna understood deep down that a, an unnatural death, be it murder or suicide, was all about physical objects. You couldn't do your, away with yourself without a tool. Virtually anything could be used to kill someone, after which it remained here, as innocent as ever and undiminished. Meanwhile, the everyday objects in the room, in this room, muffled by this fashion of philosophical dust, contained very little death. Their shapes were too smooth their corners too wooden, their harmless dullness to drive anyone to despair. At one time, Nina Alexandrovna had dreamed of special, expensive things, 
out of ordinary citizen's reach, a gun or a rifle, say, things that held death like a faucet does water, just press and out it spurts. Truth be told, she too had tried the rope, and this was the last thing that hadn't worked for her. Maybe because she was four months pregnant and had been extremely sensitive and irritated, not so much by smells, winter itself, all melting ulcers and icy ball patches seemed to smell of the moors, as by the least mess, which would not let her abide in the focused stillness she needed to calm down and stop her bitter thoughts from racing for just a while. She had been willing to pick up every speck and bring it to the communal kitchen's garbage can, which stank of rotten newspaper juices. She had endlessly put away and taken out her few possessions, trying to achieve an evenness and parallelness from the robe and cardigan lying on the bed, the evenness of a sausage. Standing on a stool now, with the noose cold and sticky from soap right under her chin, she saw below her a room so perfectly neat it looked like a scale model. Her library books pens and note to her parents looked like they'd been drawn on the table. But far away on the floor, there were some torn white threads that she was not going to get to in this life. Her legs were trembling minutely, the stool was trembling more and more, and her mouth, like a wound, kept still filling up with saliva. After a while, she winced and slipped out of the noose, which caught in back of her, up on her pinned up hair. She got to her knees on the stool's tottering square, and a lift feeling as though she'd just stepped off a merry-go-round. Afterward, she washed the floors with a laundry detergent that was so hard to get and that foamed up in hot water. The noose, half stuck together from too much smeared on soap, swung overhead like a flaccid post-party balloon. It was with this hot, blubbering cleaning that her new life had begun, a life continuous to this very day. Nina Alexandrovna had never told anyone about her illegal and unsuccessful attempt. Least of all had she been prepared to tell Alexei Afanasyevich, a man sufficiently stern that in his presence his spouse nearly forgot her own illicit act, the cigarette butts in the saucer, and how she had removed her silk blouse, which had stuck to the bloody spot under her heart, as if to commence love making.